Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. You've been listening to music from Anarchist Manifesto, the latest album from Overflow, a local artist and Cornell student. You can find more of their work at a link that we'll try to drop in the chat, projectoverflow.net. I'm Andrew Hicks, an associate professor of music and medieval studies at Cornell University and the Dale R. Corson House Professor and Dean of Hans Beta House on Cornell's West Campus. It is my honor to moderate tonight's webinar on Sounding Out Ithaca, the power of local listening, which is being streamed live from Ithaca, New York, the indigenous lands of the Cayuga Nation, whose continued sovereignty and longstanding presence on this land precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. I'd like to begin by thanking the Cornell Class of 1966, which has generously funded an endowment for West Campus, Cornell University's faculty-led residential program for sophomores, juniors, and seniors, a program charged with bringing students, staff, and faculty together in a spirit of inquiry and active citizenship. The endowment, known as Thriving Red, supports programs that promote and enhance personal connections that nurtures resilience, and that helps our students thrive. To mark its upcoming 55th reunion, the class of 66 has embarked upon a campaign to fund Thriving Red, the Arts, which expands and extends the original endowment by encouraging students to find new paths to thrive through creative expression and social engagement in the arts, and not unsurprisingly the subject of tonight's discussion. We are especially grateful to the class of 66 for their continued support of the West Campus House System, and we're delighted that the virtual format allows the members of the class of 66 to join our West Campus community this evening, together with students, other alumni, and the general public. Welcome all. We'll be glad to field questions from the audience if we can, so I encourage you to submit questions in the panel uh, via the chat um, any time. Uh, we may not get to your questions, but we'll see what we can do. And please note that this event is being recorded and will be available at the same URL afterwards. And for our students on West Campus who are joining us uh, partly as part of their course, we invite you to remember that you can join us at the Zoom link, which is available on Canvas um, 15 minutes after the webinar ends. Tonight, we explore as a collective jam session the promise and power of coordinating a local inclusive music and art scene through community organizing. And we're delighted to welcome a distinguished panel of artists, activists, and community organizers who all have deep connections to Ithaca and to the Ithaca Underground, a music and arts organization founded in 2007 to provide an all ages radically inclusive environment for do-it-yourself ambitions. We welcome this evening Enongo Lumumba Kasongo, AKA Samus, a hip hop artist and postdoctoral fellow at Brown University. Timor Gibson, an Ithaca-based musician and current chair of the board for the Ithaca Underground. Annie Lewandowski, a composer, performer, and multi-instrumentalist and senior lecturer in Cornell's Department of Music. Baba Crumrine, a musician and arts organizer, Mel Crumrine, a visual artist, and both of them have been movers and shakers in the Ithaca art scene and the Ithaca underground for quite some time. I invite our audience to check out our speakers' full bios just before the live stream to get to know them better, but to save time, I won't read their rich bios for you tonight. And we'll start by turning the field over, or the floor over to Anongo with a question how did you get involved with the local music scene as an artist, as a show organizer, and in fact, even as a board member for Ithaca Underground when you were here? And how did your growth as an artist within that DIY scene activate you to engage with issues of social injustice within and beyond the local scene? Thank you. So excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, so for me, I've known Ithaca. I've had a very long and multi-layered relationship with Ithaca. I grew up here um, as a kid, went to, you know, DeWitt Middle School, Ithaca High School, and I really feel like my kind of DIY roots come from that space because my older brother was in a band. I went to his shows. A lot of my friends, we would travel to Rochester and, you know, kind of some areas around to go and see shows. So I didn't 
connect um, the dots in terms of what I would later be doing with my life with which I what I did earlier, but it definitely the thread was there. Um, I went to Cornell for undergrad and I didn't work on music at the time because in large part, I didn't see the work that I was making as being musical. And I think that that speaks to kind of racist traditions of who gets to count as a, you know, a proper musician, what musical training looks like, who receives it, et cetera. So it took me graduating, um, learning how to rap and kind of sharing my music with folks for me to start developing kind of a, a career as an artist named Samus. And uh, at that time, after I graduated, I had taught for two and a half years in Houston, Texas, I returned to Ithaca and I wondered, how am I going to share this new body of work that I've been developing over these past few years? Who will I share it with? Who is my community here? Um, and so I, I struggled for some time to find folks, venues to perform at and, and places where I could kind of explore my expression until I went to an Ithaca Underground show um, for a colleague of mine in my department, Owen Marshall, shout out if you're anywhere seeing this or listening to this. Um, and his band was kind of doing this experimental musical performance. I went to see it, I was so captivated. And I ended up having a conversation with Bubba a little bit after that saying, hey, maybe uh, what can we do to, to have some more hip hop shows? And immediately he kind of hit me up and it was like, okay, you wanna do some shows, let's do shows. And so if you can share the, the first uh, set of slides, um, I just wanna kind of share the number of shows that I was able to be a part of after that conversation, which really inspired in me this idea that if you want something, you can build it. I said, I want to do more shows, talk to Bubba. And we did so many shows together and so many shows as part of a community. And eventually I started organizing shows when I became an assistant residence hall director at JAM, at Just About Music. Uh, we were in conversation with Ithaca Underground. We organized shows together. And so it really became this beautiful, powerful, um, full circle moment where now as a Cornell grad student, I was able to organize the kinds of shows I wish that I had had when I was an undergrad grad and the kind of shows that I enjoyed when I was, you know, in high school. And so to speak to the second part of that question, um, becoming a sort of DIY artist has opened my eyes to a lot of uh, different issues because I've seen how the ecosystem of the music world works and how it's very much interconnected with all of these issues of, of labor, of, of racism, of sexism, of, you know, that exist in all of these spaces. And of course, it has a very unique um, form that it takes within the music industry, but it still reflects these broader societal issues. So just to give a sense of that, particularly in the pandemic, um, I've seen, you know, there was a whole conversation about the post office, right? And, and making sure the post office stayed funded. And in large part, that call was coming from artists who were saying, we need the postal service because that's how we ship our merch. It's the most affordable way for us to ship our merch. We literally can't ship our merch in any other service or we're losing money, right? So there was this relationship between this infrastructure, which also happens to be one of the biggest employers of black women in this country that also is critical to the lifeblood of DIY working musicians. So I really have started to see the threads between all of these disparate, seemingly disparate movements. Um, and so we can play the, the last slide because it's, it's one of the most positive parts of my experience with Ithaca Underground. Um, and it shows my deep love. It's the end of a music video that I shot in 2016 about working through a depression and Bubba's in there, you'll see. There's Bubba. <laughs> There's Bubba again. <laughs> and then cutting relation when he 
And this is a venue that I performed at many times. These are folks, I put out the call to people who are part of the Ithaca underground scene. They came through to support me in making this music video. And so every time I watch it or listen to it, I feel like I'm back in Ithaca again. And it fills me with uh, great joy to have been part of something so special. But at least you have a sense of what is going on. Okay? Give me a call, sugar. So I think I'll I'll leave it at that and we can chat more, but I wanted to make sure I was under time. Sorry if I was talking a mile a minute. <laughs> no, thank you, Anongo. And 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 maybe those of you who worked with uh, on the on the call who've worked with Anongo uh, um, uh, could maybe reminisce about any any of the ways that the Ithaca Underground was involved in in supporting that work. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is Baba. And Anago, awesome to see you on screen. It's mm -hmm. been a while since we've been in person. It's, it's just lovely to see you. Um, yeah, I mean, just, I, I remember, I think it was like a Facebook message that, like, I think we should be doing more hip hop. And we were like, absolutely, we should absolutely be doing this. Um, you know, we'd been talking about it. We'd done a couple of shows here and there, but we were having, you know, a little bit of trouble getting some groundswell. And so we just, we were really looking for somebody who had, you know, connections, um, you know, to those communities. Um, but also, you know, have the energy to that, that had a real vetted interest in it because we had some high school students uh, that were starting to, uh, to to work on some hip hop, either beats or rapping themselves, and it was just perfect timing to to kind of launch into that. Um, and I think I love what you brought was also a like a, a multi genre approach to it as well. Like we would combine, you know, math rock with hip hop mm -hmm. or punk and hip hop or these folk hip hop shows um, that really ended up bringing in, um, you know, really broad audience base um and it was just it just made a really big impact in an important time in Ithaca to to kind of evolve the scene and I know um you know you and Chris and I met with the uh, Multicultural Resource Center and talked about what we could be doing in the community more and you know while not every idea of that meeting came out to play like th there were benefit events and educational seminars that ended up taking place that were inspired by those discussions you know and I think you know to the video 1080p um you know, for me, I think one of the lasting impacts you've had on this community were like not only talking about mental health, but making it cool to talk about <laughs> mental health and, and not even in the way of like of identifying as your your what you may be struggling with mentally, but identifying it as you know a part of you and how to manage that. And just I remember like the, one of the mental health benefits was with you and Izzy True and Etika Basement and just being in the audience and not even have to doing anything, just being there and just like just tears running down my face of like being in this community where this, I mean, the room was packed of people who wanted to be open about mental health, who wanted to be open about the systemic issues that were going on. Um, so it, it was, you know, we're grateful to have, you know, known each other for so long, um, but to have, you know, worked on all these events and really brought um, uh, to the surface other, you know, uh, the representation that needs to be there in these local communities that may not just happen if folks are just trying to let things happen of what trickles up without mm -hmm. real activism happening. Yeah, and I just wanted to, I forgot to share my last slide because I was so so laser focused on getting in the right, right time, but I've put up some images of other organizations or groups that you can absolutely be sure to get involved with. So the first is the Union of Musician and Al Musicians and Allied Workers, a number of artists who have come together starting at the kind of beginning of quarantine who recognize that musicians are workers, right? That there's labor and wanted to call attention to all sound workers that we need to organize, that we're being exploited, that systems of, of exploitation affect us deeply. Um, you can go to the next slide. There's, there's a whole campaign that they've organized called Justice at Spotify that's calling attention to um, how artists are being exploited and not receiving and not uh, able to access, um, you know, their, their own work and funds. Um, I would also call attention to other groups like As They Lay, which is a black queer focused organization, art organi arts organization, um, as well as black quantum futurism. And then of course, uh, the Southside Community Center in Ithaca, New York um, is a wonderful space that we should be supporting fully. So thank you. And Anonga, I wonder if you could maybe expand on one point, and that's uh, the kind of the way that streaming services tend to hide musical labor, 
and to present it as, as a service that you subscribe to rather than a kind of material product, you know, born mm -hmm. of an artist's hand. So I wonder how are some ways that you as a, as a musician, both touring and the local scene kind of navigate the space between, you know, availability, universal availability on streaming services, mm -hmm. but also finding replicant, re recompense and payment for the labor that goes into your work. Yes, I mean, I think touring, that's why touring is such a vital part of the lifeblood of DIY artists and, and artists more generally at this kind of stage, that that's the space where folks can make the emotional connection with an artist as a real person, as someone who labored to make this thing happen, as someone with whom you're having a spiritual energy exchange. And it's amazing to me, you know, some of the shows that have been the worst attended to me have been the shows where people have bought the most merch because of the care uh, that they, they want to sort of express you know, we came because we want to support you and we, we want to, uh, we want you to come back. And so there's this very much exchange of, of love and energy in that space. So I think spaces like Ithaca, or Ithaca Underground are so critical because they keep that momentum alive and they enable, they make it easier for artists to navigate that when there aren't as many spaces to kind of tour or be safe or receive um, kind of compensation for their work. And maybe we can come back later in the chat to think about how um, pandemic complications have both enabled new kinds of, or, or at least channeled us into new kinds of kind of digital presence, but have also created all, uh, additional complexities, especially in the touring scene, mm -hmm. which can be really damaging um, to, the, to the ability for artists to continue to do what they do. Uh, but I'll turn now to a question for, for Timur. Um, you're still, as, as IU board chair, you know, involved deeply in a, in a community-driven and volunteer-driven arts organization. So first, maybe some thoughts on that. But I also know that your work with Ithaca Underground and your own background in tech have deeply shaped your own projects. So I wonder if you could maybe share with us uh, some of the work that you've been doing that has come out of your own community of DIY Ithaca Underground um, connections. Over yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, I just wanted to say about um, uh, Inongo's piece. Uh, every time I hear that song, I get goosebumps. Uh, so there's no exception. Um, Inongo's always been a really big inspiration to me. And I think actually the first Ithaca Underground show I ever played was opening for Samus. Um, and I made sure to bring my freshest Metroid samples for that, um, which is, uh, you know, so yeah, you know, my, my project, uh, BitRot, originally started off as um, very heavily sample-based. And, you know, the idea was that there's this, all of this really cool art and media and music from old, you know, video games and movies and TV shows and stuff that just is lost to time. Like, no one is ever going to play Cyborg Justice for the Sega Genesis again, you know, unless they played it when they were a kid. But there's all these cool audio samples in it. Um, and one, uh, one kind of, uh, forgotten feature of games of that time is a lot of the games had a sound test where you could go in and, uh, you know, play individual samples or like music tracks or like, you know, laser beam sounds or whatever. Um, so it's actually really straightforward to get those sounds out of the game. You can load it up in an emulator and then, you know, record the audio output, play all the samples one by one, and then, you know, put them into whatever, um, you know, music software you're going to use. So started off doing that and, um, you know, uh, also, you know, pulling sounds from things like, you know, Metroid and Blade Runner and, you know, uh, Privateer and like all these old school sci-fi things that I really loved. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit there. Um, you know, so sort of circling back to my involvement with Ithaca Underground, um, I moved here to Ithaca in 2013, mostly for, for work. My uh, main day job is working for an IT company um, in downtown Ithaca uh, as an engineer. Um, and so I was just, uh, you know, starting my, uh, you know, tech career back then, um, you know, getting to know this, the town, um, you know, I'd always loved live music, seen mostly going to like bigger shows, not really had an uh, avenue into the DIY community until coming to Ithaca and finding out about Ithaca Underground. So started going to Ithaca Underground shows, um, Bubba and I had some friends in common and, you know, we uh, kind of knew each other tangentially and I was just kind of looking for something to do. Um, so I go up to Bubba after one show and I said, hey, I do tech stuff. Do you need any help with tech? And Bubba's like, oh my God, yes, please. Um, so I just started off, you know, uh, helping run the website, doing social media stuff. Um, 
my uh, my job at the time had me doing a lot of work with nonprofits, and IU had just gotten their 501c3 status, so I knew of all these resources that were available for uh, IU to use. So, you know, getting us discounted software and services, like email services, Adobe products, things like that. Um, and then I just really fell in love with the organization and just started doing, you know, whatever was needed. Um, running an all volunteer organization that's gotten as big as Ithaca Underground is really tough just because there's so many demands and we got really ambitious. Um, and you're just kind of limited by what you're able to do with people working for you for free. Um, and that's kind of caused some of its own issues. Um, one thing that we've, we've struggled with is if you can't pay people for the work they're doing, then you kind of end up in this class situation where the only people who can contribute at a high level are people who have disposable time um, and, you know, aren't working a ton. Like we've had members of our community who have been done doing amazing work and they said, I really wish I could do more. Um, but like, you know, I, I, you know, I work full time, I go to school, like, you know, they just, um, and that's kind of where we are kind of at a weird spot as an organization where, you know, we don't have the capacity to, you know, uh, have paid employees and all like the insurance and taxes and things that go along with that. Um, but with the kind of stuff we're trying to do really involves a huge time commitment. So, um, you know, we've just been kind of stuck there and like being able to do the best we can. And it turns out that's still pretty good. Um, but there are still, you know, opportunities that we've, we've missed out on just because, you know, we don't have, we're, we're not quite there. And like, this isn't anyone's full-time job, but um, the amount of time that people have put into this is really amazing. And we've been able to do some really cool things. Um, so for a while, you know, I was just really doing the backend organizational stuff, you know, doing like outreach and, you know, volunteer coordinate, coordination, you know, running the shows, um, just kind of being like providing a platform for other people to create and share their art and experience art at shows, but not really delving into that myself. That was always a kind of thing where it's like, oh, well, I can't do that. I'm not an artist. And it's like, well, turns out that it's, you know, um, you can be, you know, if you if you have the idea and you have the support of the community, which, you know, I, I ended up having. Um, and that's kind of also where, you know, that, that sort of attitude, I think, was definitely informed by my tech background, too, because a lot of stuff in tech, you know, you're just kind of working on the servers in the background and the people working on the actual computers have no idea what you're doing. But, you know, they're just happy that it, their email works. Um, but then I was, you know, attending more and more of these shows. And it's like, you know, having all these ideas and like, you know, being in the audience and like imagining myself being the one on stage, you know, sharing art. But it's like, oh, well, you know, I, I can never do that. Um, and, you know, I tried sort of more conventional methods a couple of times, like tried and failed how to learn to play guitar a couple of times. I just something about it. Um, I think probably the best way to describe it was I wasn't good enough at being bad for long enough to get good. Um, and, you know, I imagine there's other artists who can kind of identify with that. But, you know, I was just frustrated by my, you know, inability to really get a foothold there. Um, and so then I started thinking about it in a different way. It's like, well, you know, looking at electronic music and, you know, this background in tech, like allowing me to figure some of this stuff out. So focusing more on like synthesizers and drum machines. And I guess the thing where the place where it really all started is I asked, um, you know, my friend and, you know, longtime IU community member and board member, Chris Knight for a, a recommendation on a sampler. And I got started with a chord Volca sample. And then just like, you know, uh, like I said, you know, started cutting up samples and making, you know, uh, loops and beats with that and then adding on more and more things. And so, um, then the thing that really sort of moved it to the next level um, was focusing kind of more on the stage performance thing, because I've, I've seen a lot of really cool music and really cool performances that aren't very visually inspiring. You know, there's a lot of really cool music, but like the live performance is just some person with a laptop. And, you know, people who have that as part of their act can do things that I have no idea how to do and can make really cool music. But I always felt like when you're going to a show, you want to see something really cool. Um, and so uh, if you want to throw up the first uh, picture there, um, you know, I started off with just this, this mask um, that I got off Etsy um, and a, uh, you, you know, just some like, you know, drapey clothes and something. But then around the end of 2019, my friend built this laser jacket that I'm wearing in this picture here, um, you know, with a smoke machine to really accentuate it. And that really sort of added a whole other level to the performances. Um, and, you know, it, it like, it was really uh, a cool thing to look at. Um, and so then after that, uh, I started working on the next thing with, with my friend who showed me how to do computer modeling. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, initially started off with a laser cut prototype. And then I got my hands on a 3D printer and figured out how to make this, what I'm calling a laser claw. 
Um, and initially it was just supposed to be kind of cool effects and like, you know, trench to the smoke, kind of a cool visual effect. But then I thought about, you know, well, what can I actually use this to interact with instruments? Um, and, you know, I built uh, a MIDI controller that was triggered by this. And if you just want to uh, play the video now, you can see what that looks like. So this is a uh, MIDI controller that I built out of an Arduino and some 3D printed materials. So each one of those little white boxes has a light sensor inside. And when it's hit with laser, it sends a signal to the uh, uh, one of the synthesizers to play some notes. Um, so this isn't like a precision kind of thing. Like I have very little actual music background in like terms of like, you know, notes or chords or anything like that, but it's a really cool way to sort of generate random signal um, for uh, the for, for the synthesizer. And so, you know, basically what I do is I'll, you know, shoot some lasers, find, wait till it makes a cool noise, you know, turn that into a loop and then adjust some of the parameters. Um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, I'm running a little low on time here, but the last thing I sort of want to say about this is that video you just saw, all the things in it, I had no idea how to do any of that a year ago. You know, this was all like sort of 100% DIY, just like YouTube, Instructables, Google, you know, finding stuff on Arduino, like finding other people's code, mashing it together, like finding some code for how to use a light sensor and finding some code for how to send a MIDI signal, putting it all together. Um, it took a lot of time and like, you know, I'm in a you know, very privileged position to be able to afford a 3D printer and, you know, have these resources available. Um, I also wanted to shout out uh, Ithaca Generator, which is, uh, you know, another local organization um, that has access to these kinds of things. And, and they have 3D printers and later laser cutters that you can use um, if you're a member, um, you know, not, I'm not sure what, what their policies during the pandemic is, but um, definitely uh, things that people can use to, you know, figure out how to do this stuff themselves. No, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And it brings up the ways in which makerspaces and DIY communities can amplify voices in all sorts of ways, ways that also empower um, artists to get involved in ways that they perhaps didn't know they could. And so I think that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Timor. I think we're going to turn now to Annie. We can come back to some of the threads here, but I want to want to turn to Annie and to think about, because uh, her work reveals the real depth of the Ithaca community, not just in social and racial activism, but also in environmental activism, because you took local lessons in whale song, which led to an international practice that integrates music and marine sustainability. Could you say a little bit more about how that came about, how Ithaca turned into international um, um, uh, environmental activism? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, Drew. And thanks to the panel. It's really wonderful um, to hear Inango and Timor speak about their work. And I'm looking uh, forward to hearing from Mel and Bubba. Um, so in 2017, I began meeting with bioacoustics researcher Katie Payne at her house in Ithaca. And I initially started meeting with Katie because I was interested in how the humpback song um, evolves, which Katie made important discoveries about some decades ago. And it wasn't long in these in these lessons with Katie before I was also learning about the role of humpback song in the modern environmental movement, which Katie played a key part in, in facilitating. Uh, Katie co-produced with Roger Payne in 1970 the recording songs of the humpback whale. It's the best-selling nature recording of all time, went multi-platinum. Um, I'll put a link to the chat in, of that record. And through this, the recording, the Paines realized that sharing with the world the very fact that whales sing along with the beauty of their songs could provide an opportunity to change the way people um, perceived whales. And it was true that following the release of this record, um, conservation groups from all over the world began to get involved in the Save the Whales movement, which resulted ultimately in a global moratorium on commercial whaling. So that was all wrapped up in my early lessons with Katie. And um, in my own composition practice at that time, it inspired me to compose Cetus Life After Life for Whale Song and Chimes that some of you may have heard a few years ago coming from McGraw Tower and cascading across the campus and down the hill into Ithaca. Um, in this piece, four speakers in the tower play in sequence two recordings of humpback song, uh, one from 1977 and another from 1981, a period of really radical transformation in the Hawaiian song. And I composed for the chimes um, a part which traced the evolution of one of the themes during this period um, to, to play and duet with the humpback song recordings. And I'll put a link to Cetus in the chat as well. So I'm going to talk briefly about a few of my most recent projects that show a more um, overt, I guess, integration of music and activism. And there's this world in which humpback song recordings are used as meditative music or part of um, a new age musical genre. 
But for me, the recordings are more in the vein of a kind of deep listening of emergency that composer and performer Raven Chacon spoke about in the West Campus webinar from last semester on sonic resistance. He was referencing um, listening to recordings that he'd made in uh, 2016 at Standing Rock. So for this deep listening of emergency um, resonates with the kind of urgency I hear when listening to humpback singing. There is, of course, the beauty of the whale singing and this abyss of the ocean, but you can't listen to the songs extracting only what you want to hear, and that we can't really tune out these incredibly pressing human-created uh, conservation issues threatening whales and many other uh, sea animals. Um, so in 2019, I worked with Google Creative Lab on their um, broadly adopted web tool pattern radio, uh, Whale Songs it's called, which allows anyone explore, to explore um, thousands of hours of humpback whale song. I'll put a link to the chat, a link to that in the chat as well. Um, Google asked me to develop a virtual tour um, to help peep or, people enter into this really wonderful site. And I took it as an opportunity to not only educate people about various aspects of humpback song, but also about anthropogenic ocean noise. Since the 1960s, ocean noise has been increasing at a rate of 2.5 to 3 decibels per decade. And this increase in noise in the forms of shipping traffic, oil and gas exploration, and military sonar creates um, this effect called acoustic bleaching, which effectively obliterates the ocean soundscape and it severely limits and even prohibits marine mammals' ability to communicate. This is really significant as marine mammals rely on sound to facilitate many aspects of their survival. They can't see past their own tails in the water, but their sounds when audible can travel hundreds of miles. So also in 2019, I traveled to Hawaii with Katie through funding from the Atkinson Center for Sustainability to record humpbacks during the height of the breeding season when the humpback song is at its fullest. In Hawaii, we worked with the Hawaii Marine Mammal Consortium, which is a marine research education and conservation organization on Hawaii's Big Island documenting several different humpback singers. So now I'd like to play for you uh, an excerpt of a recording I made there using a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone, which I had lowered 30 feet below the surface of the water. Um, the recording will play and accompanying it are three photos. One is of the, the whale breaching after he finished singing. So the whale that you hear singing, that's him uh, a few minutes later. And then one of Katie and I listening from the boat and the other of me listening from the water. Okay, there's, there's, I got a lot of recordings, so if you want to hear more at some point later, I'm happy to share them. Um, so these humpback recordings will be used for two upcoming projects. The first will be here at Cornell in fall 2021. I'm organizing the Whale Listening Project, which, are, which will be uh, three days of events featuring scientists and artists celebrating the legacy of Katie and Roger Payne's work on the 50th anniversary of Songs of the Humpback Whale. We'll be sharing new work inspired by humpback song and reckoning with current issues facing marine mammals in these public events. So there'll be a link to that in the chat as well. The second and final project that I'm going to share with you is a, um, I'm working on with a computer scientist and code artist named Kyle McDonald, uh, who I met through the Google Creative Lab project. We were commissioned by um, uh, arts and sciences organization in New York City called Media Art Exploration to create a piece exploring the creative minds of humpback whales using artificial intelligence. So our piece will involve an immersive experience of humpback song using my Hawaii recordings, a visual display comparing the articulations of the song by different humpback singers utilizing a machine learning perspective, and a visual and sonic display that brings um, bycatch into the mix of the piece as well. Bycatch is one of the main threats facing cetaceans, so that's whales, dolphins, and porpoises. The marine scientist Michael Moore at Woods Hole has spoken about commercial whaling uh, as the intentional killing of whales. And so Songs of the Humpback Whale came out um, to kind of raise awareness about that. But now we're in this really devastating period of unintentional whaling. There are 650,000 whales, dolphins, and porpoises killed every year unintentionally through their entanglement in fishing gear, which is also called sometimes you hear it bycatch, sometimes or discard. So this is a, as shocking of a number as it sounds. So that's 1,780 per day and 74 during the hour of this webinar alone. 
Here in the Northeast, entanglement is a major issue for the North Atlantic right whale uh, population, which is numbering under 500 now. And these whales are killed unintentionally, but killed nevertheless through lobster pot entanglement. If you'd like to learn more about bycatch, I'll put a link to Oceana's info page in the chat as well as the uh, Global Ghost Gear Initiative. And if you'd like to learn more about how you can be a responsible seafood consumer, please check out also in the chat, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Um, though it's been delayed a bit because of COVID concerns taking priority, I've been working with Cornell Dining on their approach to sustainable seafood on campus. And if you'd like to get involved with that, please be in touch with me uh, via email. So many thanks. Yeah, thank you, Annie. A powerful example of how local connections explode outward into international crises, but then come back to roost home again in thinking about our own local uh, practices within uh, Cornell Dining, et cetera. So maybe one quick question, which others may have thoughts on too. I think this is a related um, theme, and that's how we listen to other voices, and those other voices here include the, the sort of fragile sounds and almost inaccessible, we might think, sounds of, of the natural environment of our oceans, without that listening becoming too aestheticized, becoming too extractive, right? That we're, yeah. we're pulling this out and turning it into an object uh, that turn, that is a platinum selling record or a, a beautiful siren call from the from McGraw Tower. How do we listen as much as amplify those voices. And I think this is true for all of our listening practices and visual practices for that matter. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's really a, a great responsibility on the artist to find a way to communicate. And that's something I'm absolutely reckoning with right now in this piece with these Hawaiian recordings. And um, we can't just extract the beauty. There's this whole world in which, I mean, I mean, I didn't. I debated sharing this number, but in 1970, 33,000 whales were killed um, commercial whaling, and I don't have the number about whales alone for this year. But you have 650,000, right? Whales, dolphins, and porpoises killed as bycatch, and that is the that's human. That's human created um, major conservation issues. So I, I I'm kind of in the thick of it. Drew, to be honest, trying to kind of find my way. Um, um, and we'll see where that leads. But I, I do feel the responsibility there that we can't just sort of um, take what we want in these situations. But um, and Candace Hopkins spoke about this in the webinar, too. It was such a fantastic one last semester, which I recommend you all listen to if you haven't yet. But she spoke about um, the kind of overheard voices. Uh, and and I was thinking like when about listening to these whale recordings, like you can't hear it, but there's a whole in like, you know, these sea creatures, there's, there's this whole environment they're in that's full of these noises. And I happen to get these sort of pristine recordings because of where I was and when I was. But if you go to the Google Creative Lab site, there's these huge chunks of audio where you just can't hear anything, uh, anything living at all, but you just hear engine noise. And so um, that is a great question, Drew, and one I'm continuing to wrestle with. And, but at the same time, the work that you're doing and the, 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 the ways in which you make audible um, what, it, what needs to be heard, I think, is important. And, and, and on that, we're going to sort of switch gears a bit and invite Melissa. Uh, you think a lot about how we make visible uh, things that sometimes society doesn't want us to see or, or prefers that we not uh, think of in the same terms that you want to bring to our attention. So how has your work with Ithaca Underground affected you as a visual artist? And what is the current work that you're doing um, uh, that has been influenced by that? So the floor is yours. We'd love to hear about your work. I'll unmute myself first. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to be on this panel with these amazing names. Um, so in regards to Ithaca Underground and my, my visual art, I've always been very interested in gender roles, um, the tradition of gender roles in our society, and how these imposed ideals affect groups of people and individuals, um, and how we develop to either align with them or to rebel against them and how there's sort of this continuous feedback loop. So it's kind of always there, whether we're uh, uh, adhering to those, those roles or not. So the first, when we began IU, one of the first things that really struck me were the young women who were coming out as audience members but I've been going to shows for 
decades, mostly mostly punk and metal shows. Uh, and for the most part, the audience, the women made up a very small percentage of the audience. And the women who were there, for the most part, were you know being dragged around by their boyfriends. They were only there because their boyfriends were in the band or you know they were standing in the corner being kind of aloof sort of bored with the whole situation uh, every a, a lot of the women there including myself were doing a very good job of performing within their gender roles of being the demure passive gender so then with come IU meeting all these young women they were so active they were incredibly self-possessed incredibly confident they were there for the show they were there to be excited they wanted to get involved they wanted to get up front they were going to dance around they're going to start their own bands and it was like something i'd never seen before it was really inspiring to me but it was also i felt very protective of them because it seemed like no one had told them they couldn't act that way (laughs) and i didn't want anyone to tell them that i wanted them to be who they were um so then a, a few years later, I was asked to participate in a, a show uh, centering on the, the feminine identity. And for me, that, that uh, I, I focused on being a fat woman. And as I uh, developed what turned out to be, um, I may have been better off without you, the, the graphic novel, um, I realized that I, I never felt like a fully fleshed out woman. I wasn't allowed to be a woman. And... I realized that, that we have this this uh, sort of this gold standard of a woman in our society where it's a white, slender, heterosexual, demure, with breasts and a vulva. Like that's what you that's that's a woman. And because I was a fat person, I didn't get to be that. I I was flawed. I was a girl at best. Uh, so I was denied this, you know, very basic part of my identity. And then I was thinking of all the people I met through IU and thinking, well, if I, as a white cis woman, feel such a negative impact, how much stronger is this for the, for these, these women who have layers of bias um, against them? And so now when I, I do these work, um, I, it makes me sort of want to shoulder open that, that female door and let in all of our various identities, all of our various characteristics, I, I really want to normalize everything that a woman can be. So I think working with IU, my work has shifted from being a lot about telling my own story and maybe wanting to inform people about me. And it's really sort of, uh, I've, I've been thinking more about the masses of people and wanting to talk to them wanting them to like look at my work and, and be able to say, yeah, I can identify with that in my own way and maybe have them continue the conversation about all of us. So it's just me screaming into the void about my own uh, unhappinesses. We can all come together and sort of talk about it and normalize who we are. And I know you brought some of your work with you today. Could you talk us through some of the uh, images that you've um, provided for us? Sure. So, this first one that we're looking at is one of the older paintings um, I did. It's called This Is Okay. Um, and this is still when I was still very fo- focused on uh, just my like just my own uh, uh, role in society. I was it was um, still thinking about myself as as a a lesser fat person, um, but trying to normalize seeing the uh, the fat body, um, particularly like I, I'm a um, obviously a big comic book fan, so. Um, but a lot of the time in comic books, you don't see larger people, uh, as especially as a, as a main character. So this was a this was a in response to that sort of body type. Um, uh, this one is uh, <laughs> something doesn't feel right. Um, this is uh, something that a lot of of people, uh, a lot of fat people are told, especially by doctors and and. Uh, uh, athletic enthusiasts will say, oh, there's a thin person in there trying to get out, which is just one of the most insulting things you can tell anybody. <laughs> so this is my uh, response to that is I think a doctor had literally just told me um, 
that that I could be I could be better if I really tried. And so this was a you know a, an image of a woman just putting on her fat suit because it's just that easy to be somebody else. Um, this is um, I'm starting a series of of Renaissance style painting. So this was uh, I'm going to forget the painting I was inspired by, but this is a um, sort of a, a modern reproduction of a, uh, a painting done in, I want to say, the late 1600s, early 1700s, where the, the larger body was very celebrated. So this is um, the first of my series of, of, um, of women of that same body type being put into a more modern uh, setting. Yeah, and so these next four are just some um, clips or uh, uh, samples from the, the graphic novel that I made during the pandemic that was um, inspired off of the, the feminine identity show that I was asked to do a few years back. So this is largely autobiographical, but um, I feel like it's, it's also stemming from a lot of things that I've heard during conversations with other people um, about how their, their, uh, their bodies are spoken about to them or about them behind their backs. And I think your your work really points to the ways that Ithaca Underground includes not just the kind of sonic environment um, that is that is so rich here in Ithaca, but also the visual art of of, of of supporting the artists, but also the poster scene and all the remarkable uh, the the remarkable visual culture uh, videos as well that attend um, all this work. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the most. Because I'm not I'm not a musician. I'm I'm a, an enthusiast. But this was a uh, it was very exciting to be able to get people involved who also didn't weren't musicians or didn't think they were musicians, much like, you know, Timur was talking about. Um, so saying that, you know, there's a place for you to, to have your voice heard here um, through flyers. And we did have a, a, <clears throat> a zine for a while so people could do their artwork there. We had a one art show that was pretty successful, but it was, uh, it was really wonderful to have, um, be able to give people the options of how to speak their, their identities. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And, you. and on that note of, of finding ways to allow people to speak their identi identities, the pandemic has presented new challenges. And I know, Bubba, you've been working hard, you know, uh, building on your longstanding work with Ithaca Underground as well, to find ways to keep local and regional voices heard. And so could you share with us some of the ways that you've been doing that in recent months? Definitely, Drew. And uh, just thanks again for having me and great to uh, see all these, you know, Annie and Anango, Timor and Mel. I mean, we've, we've, we've done so much work together over the years here. Uh, it's just great to be a part of this panel. Um, so sort of starting now and kind of moving backwards, uh, coming up this Friday, I've curated at the Gunner Brown's next uh, streaming event via Twitch. Um, opening is going to be Charles Chapman, a.k.a. Flos, who's uh, – uh, sort of using those objects on the floor there in the imagery. Um, he's going to be performing object-based uh, noise improvisations. Uh, they're a Cornell alum who I met while I was speaking at one of Annie's classes. Um, we connected, and shortly after, we were booking their hip-hop trio, No Comply, in which they were drumming. Um, and it, it'll have been two years since the last show that Flos and I worked together on, so I'm excited to be reconnecting to see what they have up their sleeves and uh, what their new album is going to have in store. Um, Jason Calhoun, who's uh, next over there, uh, is a sound artist who recently returned to Ithaca uh, after several years in Philadelphia. Uh, we get, began working with Jason while he was still in high school, um, where his ambient music played a key role in several IU uh, curated events, and his current solo work uh, has continued to be an extension of the, the beautiful uh, small music uh, that he was creating as Naps. Um, Bo Mahadev, who we have a clip from, uh, their uh, latest album, Bandcamp, uh, currently residing in Hong Kong, is also a Cornell alum. Uh, Bo played a key role in the redesigning of the Ithaca Underground website uh, while an undergrad, along with helping out with our newsletter before that, uh, and went from behind the scenes uh, to the stage, as is a similar, a similar story tonight, um, propelled by the Arduino devices that they built and programmed. Um, I haven't seen them since uh, their move to Hong Kong, so delighted to see the evolution of their dark synthy art pop. 
um, that they've been creating over the last few years here. And closing the night um, all the way over uh, is Kieran Neuringer, uh, also recently returned to Ithaca uh, after some time in Philly. He's a saxophonist, um, composer, who uh, whose work is underpinned by interdisciplinary approaches and social political contextualizations. Uh, and he's best known for a personal and intensely physical um, saxophone technique uh, revealed through long form solo improvisations and as a founding member of the acclaimed um, Irreversible Entanglement Irreversible Entanglements uh, group who headlined uh, what would be the last uh, big day in fest uh, that took place in the building that was the haunt. Um, so last time that we were there, which is pretty, pretty interesting. So that's coming up on, on Friday. Um, and we can jump to the next slide here. Before that, back in May, I'd put my next studio album on hold due to the pandemic and had focused on uh, creating a remotely collaborative EP entitled A Pot Apart, uh, which with uh, 10 additional performers from family members like my sister in Tasmania, uh, DIY musicians such as Smax Maxwell, Jim and Rekka Wells, um, you know, two professionals like uh, Brian Wilson, who's in my band Brian, uh, along with uh, Amy Zadima uh, and Matt Suguchi Murano, who we're hearing right now um, in our collaboration track um, from uh, Hope to Flame and Fire. And so, you know, a lot of these folks had, um, you know, performing and recording and engineering opportunities drastically impacted by the pandemic. Um, and while that collaboration had begun in the spring, by the time it was released in July, uh, you know, activism had erupted across the country calling for much needed changes to acknowledge and end systemic racism. Uh, and we ended up pointing all of the proceeds uh, for that to the Black Trans Advocacy Coalition mission, which aids in Black trans health, housing, and employment, and included a, a, a targeted COVID response fund. So that's their, their logo down in the corner that you're seeing there. Um, so sort of a, a couple-pronged couple approach from working with folks that needed some help to trying to throw some funds to people who needed it even more crucially. Um, jumping to the next slide, um, all of this has been was inspired by uh, the invitation to curate for Experimental Sound Studios um, the quarantine concert series last April, thanks to our uh, former Ithaca Underground volunteer coordinator, Carrie Cooper, who actually worked at Mann Library for a while. Um, the event, which we've got the audio clip from here, was part of uh, the inaugural events, which The Wire picked up uh, as a feature and presented local and regional musicians such as Desmond Bratton, Amirtha Kadambi, who we're hearing now, Jen Cutler, uh, Ada Adamatha, uh, Chris Corsano, and myself. Um, so all the musicians impacted by the pandemic, you know, had lost tours, uh, recording, seminars, and more. Uh, and given the uncertainty that was ahead, I wanted to ensure in this, you know, one of these first events in the series that we were representing uh, the black communities, communities of color, and queer communities. Um, you know, especially since we, on a positive note, we're no longer limited by distance and only technology. And so. I've listened to Amirtha sing. <laughs> and if we want to jump to the, the final slide here, uh, relating back to queer communities, uh, I recently finished recording my next album, uh, whose topics center around my journey into coming out as non-binary uh, after years of mostly non-verbal gender non-conformity. Um, so, you know, after 13 years of helping and uh, centering others, I felt it was important to start telling my own stories. Um, you know, given my position as a leader in our, lo in our local music community, being a director outside of music, um, you know, representation really matters, uh, visibility matters, and being, you know, open and honest and true about our ourselves in these times is powerful, um, especially coming out of the last administration we've had to deal with. Uh, and in the end, it's healthy. Um, so this is a clip from the uh, the last stream that I did in December that Timor had curated. Um, so just you know appreciate uh, all the work that Timor has been doing leading Ithaca around to, through this pandemic. Um, you know and having leading the org organization um, after AJ and I did.
Thank you, Baba. Remarkable, remarkable. Well, and we've got a few minutes for some synthetic questions. And so I'd like to pose first a question for Anongo and then, and then Timur. And that's about the power of the local. Um, and to think about the ways in which, you know, uh, so often the music scene and the ways we think about music scenes is now through Spotify or Tidal or YouTube or whatnot. But the ways in which local communities are born from these DIY, you know, pop up, whatever it might be, how does that affect who gets amplified, who gets heard? And, and how would you recommend that, that folks get involved? So maybe we'll start with you, Anongo, and then to, to you, uh, Timur. Yeah, I mean, something that has has really um, kind of emerged in this conversation to me is the deep entanglement between Ithaca Underground and Cornell University, right, and, and Ithaca College. We can extend it to, to thinking about that, and that there's a, a relationship between these institutions and this scene. And so, um, you know, in part, I'm... I'm also thinking about the question to to Annie around how we deal with complicity, part of that as a you know a major institution is ensuring that this local scene has the support that it needs to thrive. Right, is making a commitment beyond sort of you know someone being a particular representative at that school. Like, what can we do at the structural level? to ensure that this scene has the support that it needs. Because I think as Timor was getting at, it can be really challenging when folks have the constraints of, of work, financial constraints. There's all of these issues that surround being able to participate. And so one of the things that I think major institutions can do is when, when there's a scene like this that exists in the space, I mean, what a blessing is to provide um, all kinds of tangible support, whether that's spaces uh, for performance or instruments or, um, you know, spaces with resources for per performing and recording music or financial incentives. I think one of the, the great challenges of living in the, the U.S. is that there's very little support for art and artists, and it's very, very scrappy. So anything that I think institutions with the, the kind of infrastructure that Cornell and, and Ithaca College have, uh, that what they can do is to ensure that that local scene stays. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now without Ithaca Underground. I can say that um, with 100% certainty. I wouldn't have a job as a professor teaching in a music department if I had not had the opportunity to grow as a musician and an artist in a space that was welcoming and allowed me to be loud. And um, so I, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for the institution to then support, um, you know, directly, I think, the efforts of folks who are in these communities. A, a powerful message, and Timur, I'm sure one you agree with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, around the time that I was really getting involved with the leadership of Ithaca Underground, you know, joining the board, coming on as a coordinator, and eventually being uh, elected as board chair, IU was doing a lot of really intentional work about the kinds of content and artists and audiences we wanted to focus on. Um, and, you know, it's really thinking, it's like, you know, for a lot of scenes, and sometimes I forget just because of, you know, how amazing IU is, a lot of music scenes are really dominated by, you know, cis, het, white males, um, which, you know, has just kind of been a big part of the local scene. And uh, turns out those people tend to support and book each other. Um, you know, I'm not, don't want to make a broad generalization because of course there are, you know, um, that's not always the case, but so we really made it our mission to focus and center on um, artists of color and queer and trans artists and femmes and you know, young people um, to re really, really give them this first opportunity to share their music um, and, you know, get themselves out there where, you know, they might've been passed over um, by a lot of other more conventional booking organizations. Um, another thing that was really important to us is making sure that they got paid for their work and that, you know, they're not just playing for exposure or whatever, because, you know, they're doing real work and it's important. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, sometimes would have, um, you know, shows that didn't do too well, but we always made sure to pay people. We always had this buffer of either grant funding or, um, you know, money that we'd taken in. So, Typically, typically when we would do a show, we would do a split between the the artists for, you know, door sales or, you know, sometimes we'd have a grant to do a specific show, but IU would never take more than maybe five or 10% of ticket sales. 
And the only purpose of that was if we have a show that's not very well attended, we can sort of dip into that and, you know, make sure we're paying people. You know, for a while we had, we were successfully um, doing an effort to make sure we pay all the local artists at least $50 per performance. Um, and through our grant funding through Community Arts Partnership, for example, uh, you know, we were able to do that. Um, so, you know, yeah, it was really important to us that these people have these opportunities to share their music in spaces that they haven't ever really been before. Um, and other organizations in town have also been really great to work with. So uh, the fan club collective at Cornell, you know, booked a lot of house shows. Uh, uh, Bo Madev, you know, uh, was, was working uh, a lot with them, um, you know, when Bo was still at Cornell. Um, and also various house shows and house venues um, around town that are operate in, you know, a little bit of a more, more of a gray area. Um, and I just sort of want to close out with this, you know, once the pandemic is over and we're doing in-person shows again, these house venues are going to pop up again. Um, and this is a story or a sort of trend that's very personal to IU and, you know, kind of pushed IU into, you know, what it is now. But um, if you're a student out there and you're attending house shows and there's this really cool house venue and you want to write an article about it and tell everyone about it, don't do it. You know, tell your friends, but don't get it published because you're going to get the house venue shut down and it's going to be really sad. So, I mean, kind of ironically, that's how you got it start is that, you know, Bubba was having shows and Bubba and I were having shows in their basement. Word got out and they couldn't do that anymore. And so then that kind of pushed them into, you know, these bigger venues. And we also had a similar story with um, a uh, house venue that was being run by IC students that actually ended up turning into a really cool partnership after they couldn't do house shows anymore. Um, you know, uh, one of their uh, organizers, um, Mel Marsh, is now one of our booking coordinators and has, you know, been before the pandemic was using our venues um, and doing a lot of collaboration. So cool stuff has come out of that. But in general, don't blow up the spot. Don't, you know, over publicize a good thing. Um, on, on that note, a good reminder why it's underground sometimes needs to keep some of its venues underground so as to support the ways in which, you know, music happens in all sorts of ways and sound and visuals, everything come together. On that, we're going to have to wrap things up. We could talk again for another hour, uh, if not more. But good news for students on West Campus, we will talk for another hour. You're welcome to join us at the link on Canvas, which is a private Zoom link. So to anyone else on West Campus who has that link, please join us at 845. That will lock, um, so just be sure you're there on time. And I want to thank all of our panelists for such a rich ear-opening discussion, eye-opening visuals. Just a real pleasure and honor to work with you today. So thank you all. And to everybody who joined us tonight, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you at a future West Campus uh, and Injustice for All webinar. Good night, everyone.